Uh, it is great to be with you and uh, great to think with you just a little bit about um, this series on the history of the church. Uh, my experience is that most people either love or hate history. Um, it's uh, something that really appeals to some people. We like to read about history. We like to see historical movies, maybe. We, we just have an interest in history. It, it resonates somehow. Or we are people who just hate history. And uh, uh, if you hate history, it's probably the fault of your high school history teacher. Um, I say that because my wife spent her career as a high school history teacher, and she was really good at it. Um, I had a professor once who used to say, history is so interesting, you have to work really hard to make it dull. Unfortunately, most historians are very hardworking. Uh, so, um, we have worked very hard not to make this dull, and uh, yet I think it's tremendously important. It, it's tremendously important because uh, one of the truths about this is that Jesus made us a promise. And the promise Jesus made that I have in mind, He made us many promises, is I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a very precious promise. Uh, particularly in tough times, it's a precious promise. No matter how strong the wrong seems, uh, God is triumphant yet. And uh, uh, Jesus is demonstrating the fulfillment of that promise through the whole history of the church. And uh, He records some of that history for us in the Bible, in the book of Acts. So the book of Acts is the first stage of Jesus showing that He keeps His promises and that He's building His church. And the book of the Acts shows us that church being built from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. Big journey in those days. A great shift of culture in those days. Christ keeps His promise. Now, as a historian, I think it would be wonderful if we had the Holy Spirit's history of the church, uh, so that we can know exactly what's been going on, why it's going on, uh, what was good, what was bad, but we don't yet. I, I'm still hopeful one day we'll have the Holy Spirit's history of the church, but we don't have it yet, and so we have to try to study it for ourselves, try to make the best we can out of it. Um, and my approach in the um, 73 lectures I've done, um, I used to be six foot seven, and Chris Larson has just pounded me down into the ground. Um, the, the effort I've made in these lectures is to try to understand as best we can how Christ has been building His church in every age. Uh, even in 73 lectures, we can't begin to do more than just touch the surface of things. But part of what I'm after is to help us see that we as Christians, as Protestant Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, are not Latter-day Saints. Uh, we do not believe that the church died out for a time, only to be restored later. Uh, the church did not die out in the ancient church period. It did not die out in the Middle Ages. It was not restored by Martin Luther after it had disappeared altogether. It wasn't even restored by John Calvin or by Jonathan Edwards or whoever your favorite theologian is. I don't want to disillusion you, but it was not restored by R.C. Sproul. Uh, no, through the whole history of the church, Christ has had His people. And throughout the whole history of the church, there have been times when God's people understood and followed the Word of God better, and there have been times when they followed it not so well. There have been times when the church got some things really right, and at the same time, got some things really wrong. Isn't it nice? We never have those sorts of problems. 
we always have everything exactly right. Uh, part of what I think history can teach us is a little bit of humility, uh, that living the Christian life, understanding the Word of God, is a demanding enterprise. And uh, while we need to be critical of figures in the past when they get things really wrong, uh, we also have to try to have a measure of charity to understand why they got things wrong in hopes that other people will have charity towards us if we get some things wrong. And so this, uh, this study of the history of the church is, is designed primarily to help you understand how you got to where you are today as a Christian. Uh, what are your connections with the past? Uh, the first series in uh, this uh, church history series is on the ancient church from about 100 to about 600. 500 years, that's a long time. Um, that's 25% of the whole history of the church. But when we look back at it, we think, well, that's kind of short, you know. Um, but that was a tremendously important period in the life of the church. It was foundational. Uh, they had to figure out all sorts of things that we take for granted. Uh, they had to figure out, they had to recognize what books belong in the Bible. Now, it's only God who ultimately establishes the Bible, but the church had to listen for the voice of God to determine what books belonged in the Bible. That, that early church had to unger, undergo persecution of a very intense sort when they were just a tiny group of people. How did they survive? That church had to wrestle with heresies and gave to us the great gift of a biblical understanding of the Holy Trinity. We are inheritors of that. Very often we just take the Trinity for granted. It was a struggle in the ancient church to come to a clear biblical understanding about how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit relate to one another as one God. They defended the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ against those who would reduce Him to just being a human. And so this is really a, a fascinating period of the history of the, the church, and we're connected to those people because we carry the same Bible. Well, they didn't carry it because they didn't have printing, uh, but we have the same Bible. We're committed to the same Bible that they recognized. Uh, we're committed to the same understanding of God and of Christ that they had. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to know about the, the rich heritage that they left to us. Uh, in the Middle Ages, which is the second part of this series where we cover uh, almost a thousand years, uh, we do spend a lot of time on things that were going wrong in the church. Uh, the way in which tradition was beginning to have an authority all of its own in the life of the church. Uh, but that thousand years of medieval history is also a rich time of Christian civilization, where Christians were trying to think through issues. What does Christianity mean for architecture? What does Christianity mean for art? What does Christianity mean for politics? And so, it's a period of rich Christian reflection, even when a lot of things are going wrong, theologically, that is still relevant and stimulating today. I've heard it said that some Christians feel we have political difficulties to face in our time. That's sort of a joke. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to be political here, but I heard Cal Thomas say, a couple of days ago, um, we are not facing the lesser of two evils. We are facing the evil of two lessers. <laughs> now, you don't have to agree with that. This is not a political rally. Um, but, but the whole question of how do Christians relate to political power 
is a very relevant question. The Middle Ages helps us think through that. Then the third series is on the Reformation. You're just hearing about the Reformation. The centrality of the Reformation as a great return to the Bible. Some of you have a Reformation study Bible. Uh, the whole notion of Bibles for God's people, uh, Bibles in the language of God's people, uh, Bibles with notes that can help God's people understand the Scriptures more easily. Uh, that goes back to the 16th century in the time of the Reformation, and we're all the heirs of that. We're the products of that. Uh, that was the great time when the, the great truths of the Bible, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, um, because of the Bible alone, these ringing cries of the Reformation, we are still cherishing. We have inherited. And so that's the, the third um, section, the third series in this church history series. Um, I think uh, Chris and I originally thought that maybe there'd be four or, or at most five, but it's interesting as you get closer to your own time in history, um, you just naturally get a little more interested in it because it's a little more familiar. It's not as strange. Uh, and because the details do become a little more directly relevant. So we ended up with the fourth series on the 17th and 18th centuries and uh, focusing uh, there in part on Puritanism, a great refinement of Reformed theology of, of great spiritual depth and understanding, um, and also focusing then on the Great Awakening in America. Uh, we get finally to America and to what's going on in America and the developments in American religion, and the whole idea that will become so powerful in American church history of revival. What does it mean to be revived? Is revival a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, what exactly is a revival? How does a revival come about? Uh, Jonathan Edwards at the Great Awakening said a revival is the sovereign, mysterious work of the Holy Spirit. You don't know when it's going to come. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know how long it's going to last. All you can do is pray for it and wait. But by the 19th century, Charles Grandison Finney came along and said, anybody can hold a revival if they just follow the right method. It's purely human determined, said Finney. And a lot of people have followed Finney ever since then. So which kind of revival is right? What should we think about revival? So we look at that a little bit in the fourth series, uh, the second half on the 18th century, and then we look even more at the 19th century. The fifth series originally was going to be on the 19th and 20th century, and by then I was so tired and moving so slowly, we had to divide it into two. Um, and uh, so the fifth series is on the 19th century, a huge century of change in the Western world. And part of what we look at that we are experiencing very much today, part of what we look at in that uh, fifth and sixth series on the 19th and 20th century, is how Christianity as the dominant religion in the West, um, Christianity as the dominant cultural influence in the West, begins to lose its dominance. Uh, what we used to call Christendom, the Christian civilization of the West, uh, begins to be increasingly eroded, particularly in the 19th and 20th century. And what we have to look at is how do Christians react to that? What's good about that? What's bad about that? And uh, surely we see that in our own day in a more radical way. What, what you see is the erosion of Christendom which gets underway in a significant way in the 19th century, really picks up speed and becomes more and more serious as the 20th century moves on. And that becomes a very important issue of Christians today understanding who we are, how we got there, and what our calling is. Uh, 
Um, it, it's, it's a huge aspect of how we understand ourselves and what we think we ought to be doing to make things better today. And it's not always easy, especially for uh, people like me who are old. And uh, we, we grew up in America where there were certain things assumed. Now, I know not everybody was a good Christian in America when I was young. But there were certain Christian values that were pretty universally admired, even if they weren't always lived up to. But today, those Christian values are widely rejected. Now, not in a pious place like Washington. Um, I'm, I'm talking about California, of course, uh, where I'm from. Uh, but not only is this culturally unsettling, unsettling how, did, how, did we, how did this happen? Just to use one illustration, I'm a little hesitant to use it because it, uh, I think we as Christians um, maybe turn to homosexual examples too quickly, and uh, uh, I think we need to be sure our churches want to welcome homosexual sinners and call them to repentance and the gospels for them too. Um, but it's fascinating from a historical point of view, in the whole of human history, Gay marriage was never legal until the year 2000. In the whole of human history, in the whole of the world, that's true. And yet now, in 2016, we find large segments of society thinking this is the most natural and indeed important right to be maintained that can be imagined. How'd that happen? What should we think about that? Where are we going? And part of the challenge, of course, for us as Christians is, is to begin to distinguish the cultural effects of Christianity that can be good from the religious core of Christianity that we have to hold on to. The religious core of Christianity is what we must insist on continuing to be whether we have any cultural impact or not. And so this church history series, I hope, helps us think through some of those issues, uh, both historic issues but also very contemporary issues uh, about who we are and, and what it ought to be uh, mean to be a Christian uh, today, because Christ is still building His church. Uh, in the ancient church, almost all of Christianity was in the region around the Mediterranean Sea. North Africa was a strong part of Christianity. By the end of the ancient period, Egypt had become a strong part of Christianity. The majority of the Egyptian population remained Christian until the year 1000. And then only gradually thereafter did Islam become the majority religion in Egypt. One of the intriguing statistics I came across fairly recently is that when the forces of Islam conquered Egypt in the seventh century, there were eight million Christians in Egypt, which was almost all the population. Today there are about 80 million people in Egypt. Do you know how many Christians there are in Egypt, baptized Christians? Eight million. Now, I can't read their hearts. I don't know whether they're regenerated or not. But under a lot of pressure, they have continued to name the name of Christ and be baptized in His name. And I find that kind of intriguing. Um, as we read history, we might think, oh, I wish all of Egypt was Christian today. I think we ought to look at a globe and say, I wish this whole globe was Christian today. But Christ has built His church and is still building His church in Egypt and all around the world. Um, in the Middle Ages, the, the center of Christianity moved increasingly north and west into Europe. And then in this 
recent century or so, Christianity has moved dramatically south into Africa, South America, dramatically east into Asia. And so Christ is still building His church. It's an exciting story. Uh, and it's intriguing that where some people seem as a culture to tire of Christianity, the Spirit of the Lord seems to say, it's all right, I can move on. There are other people. And um, it should be sobering for us as Americans to pause and think about how can we best in our time contribute to Christ building His church? And uh, there are a number of answers to that. We need to be praying. Uh, We need to be ensuring that we have faithful preaching of the gospel in our churches. And we need to have intellectual resources to strengthen us. We are are facing, it seems, ever-growing intellectual challenges to Christianity and and an ever-growing sense that Christianity is not capable of intellectual defense. There's a growing sense of mockery of Christianity in uh, in universities. And, And in this day, one of the things we need is strong resources that help us answer the critiques of Christianity, the intellectual critiques of Christianity, the so-called scientific uh, critiques of Christianity. And um, I'm so pleased that that Ligonier is one of the agencies the Lord is using to provide a strong intellectual defense of Christianity and to help Christians have a sense that the truth of our faith Uh, is not absurd, is not irrational, is not indefensible, uh, but in fact will accomplish exactly the purposes Christ has for it. And that when we are called to love the Lord with all our strength, we're also called to love Him with all our minds. And I think that's a great calling, a necessary calling for us today. So I encourage you to use uh, many of the resources that uh, Ligonier provides and uh, take a look at uh, church history. Um, And maybe I can convince you it's not the dullest subject you ever studied. Thank you very much.